And tonight we're talking about the holidays and we have our special guest, Dr. David Denaev. And he is an internist specializing in lifestyle medicine. His focus is on prevention and treatment of chronic disease through a nutrition, fitness, and stress management. And his website is medical, www.medicalcompassmd.com. So thank you, Dr. Denea, for coming back again. We always love having you. Welcome. You're welcome. Um, uh, you left off one major piece of what I do. And Why? Critical. So what I do is I'm an integrative medicine doctor. Uh-huh. Lifestyle medicine's fine. Integrative medicine, though, combining conventional medicine with lifestyle modifications. But what's critical here is not just the treatment and prevention, but the reversal of chronic diseases. Oh, I and know. And reversal I like that is too. very, very important because I just got a statement from a patient who had chronic kidney disease or has chronic kidney disease to stage five, which is the level um, where you go to dialysis. Wow. And his nephrologist, he just saw his nephrologist today or yesterday, and his nephrologist was shocked in terms of his kidney function. His kidney function went up by 40, 45% in six weeks. Wow. And now he's no wow. longer on the border of stage five. He's stage four. We want to get him better. But he's moving up. And uh, he was shocked. And he said, you know, I've never, ever seen in my life, I've never seen anyone go up in function, not down in function when they're at this level. And that's what the nephrologist or the kidney doctor said. So reversal is very important and we should recognize that. And we should recognize that at every point, whether it be at the holidays or not at the holidays or any holidays or any time of the year, you can always reverse disease. It doesn't matter when you're focused on lifestyle modification. Well, I'm gonna throw that back at you and say, you need to update your website then. Well, then it's, up to, it's going to be updated. <laughs> that's, that's on there already. Because Don't throw anything back. back at me. I am. I am. So, I am totally throwing it back. Let, let me just go into, and then you can interrupt me as we go, each segment if you want. But I looked up and thought about some of the research that's around in terms of what are the impacts, the short-term impacts. And I don't think we should just say for the holidays, I think short-term impacts in terms of when you're thinking about eating and when you're thinking about lifestyle, the holidays are a great excuse to think about the short-term impacts, but the short-term impacts should be thought of whenever you make a decision to eat. So I think it, when you look at this, when you think about, for instance, weight gain, or you think about different areas that indulging in food for say, we're going to go on a trip and we're going to do a two week trip, or we're going to do a month's trip, or we're going to decide we're not going to follow any specific diet. We're just going to go with the wind as it blows. And we're going to follow basically the standard American diet, which is, as we know, sad. The acronym, you know, it stands, it's sad. That's the acronym. And, and that's what it is. But the effects it has on people range from as mild as fatigue, bloating, dizziness, headaches. Those are the short-term effects, but also weight gain, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And the effects go on and on and on, and they become more and more serious. But the short-term can lead to long-term also, because when you're not following a specific diet that's beneficial, like a plant-based diet, a whole foods plant-based diet, when you're not following something like that, then your taste buds change back to the standard American diet. Then yeah. your addictions go back to that standard American diet. Then you basically got to start all over from ground zero. So it's not just about a specific time of the year. It's about sticking with what you're doing. And when you're getting really good results, stick with it and don't think that you're impervious to effects of switching back to a standard Yeah, but American isn't diet. the holiday time, I mean, this is what we're coming into is the holiday mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't there... I, I thought I read somewhere along the line that the holiday season, you, you see an increase in the amount of heart attacks, things like that along that way, or illnesses, chronic illnesses. Is that true? Well, I don't know specifically if you see an increase in heart attacks. What I think you see is an increased risk in terms of, definitely in terms of heart disease and potentially cardiovascular events. 
But what happens is, for instance, there was a study done that showed that a high fat meal, one high fat meal, resulted in blood vessel changes in healthy men. And this was a very small study. This was with, I have to show my age by putting on my glasses, I apologize. By eating a single high fat meal, and it was done by the Medical College of Georgia. And they studied 10 patients and five of them were given a high fat meal and five of them were not given a high fat meal. Were given a normal type level or a low fat meal, I guess. You know, and what they found was there were impacts on the red blood cells. And what's important about the red blood cells is that there are trillions of red blood cells in their body and they carry cholesterol and they carry nitric oxide. And cholesterol and uh, nitric oxide are involved with vasodilation of the blood vessels and so or the elasticity of the blood vessels. And so what happens is when you have this high fat meal, what they found was that the size of the red blood cell shrank and that the elasticity seemed to go down and that an enzyme was elevated that's implicated in atherosclerosis or plaques in your arteries and heart attacks. And that enzyme is called myeloperoxidase or MPO. It's a very common enzyme that's studied. And what they found was that when that goes up, it reduces potentially the blood vessel elasticity or the increase in atherosclerosis or the stiffening of the arteries. And you also get what's called oxidation of HDL. HDL is supposedly our good cholesterol. And good cholesterol, well, it's a modifier because good cholesterol isn't necessarily good. But when it's oxidized, it's definitely not good. It becomes bad. It becomes evil. It's like feeding gremlins. Do you remember the movie Gremlins? Of when course. You, right. When you feed them after midnight, they become evil. And so the HDL, when you feed them a high-fat meal, can actually cause them to oxidize and become dangerous or evil. So you want to think about how these affects the body and it's with one high fat meal. And also what's interesting is that white blood cells increase in terms of number and you get pro-inflammatory what's called monocytes. Monocytes are a type of white blood cell and when they increase it's like seeing an infection. So you're almost producing an infection by eating a high fat meal. So this actually increases your risk of potentially having a heart attack by the narrowing of the blood vessel. Now, what you're going to ask me right after that is, does it increase your risk of stroke? And the answer is, it's a mixed bag. With stroke, nobody knows, but it seems like the latest research from, published in the New England Journal of Medicine with 44,000 men showed it did not increase the risk of stroke during a high fat meal. You would have thought it would. During the holidays, you would have thought it would, but it doesn't necessarily. However, they had a caveat with that study and they said that people who were doing that study didn't know why they were doing it. They weren't told, but they all started to go toward weight loss and tried to eat better and better and better. So it was kind of screwing up the data. So okay. they're not sure whether it's an actual effect or not, but you can't necessarily clump heart disease, and stroke together. However, there's weight gain too. And weight gain occurs in holiday eating, but it also occurs at other times, but especially between Halloween and New Year's, you see a lot of weight gain. And there was a study done that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that you gain a huge amount, 1.3 pounds really disappointing because it really only showed 1.3 pounds. And you say to yourself, well, what's 1.3 pounds? You can take off 1.3 pounds. But what they found was it took people about six months to take those 1.3 pounds off when they gained those pounds. Six However, months? Wow. It took them supposedly six months. I don't know why it took a while to lose those, the amount of weight that they gained, even though it was a small amount of weight. What this means is that this, this may not be able to be applied to the general population, that you, uh, it would take you a while. Now, I may be combining something and saying that it takes six months, but whatever weight you gain takes about six months supposedly to get off from holidays. 
Now, okay. in terms of weight gain in my practice, how much weight gain do I see? Usually about four pounds of fat. So it's not 1.3 pounds of fat. It's closer to, a lot closer to four pounds. Some, yeah. I see, some I see six pounds, some I see even eight pounds. So the actual number based on a study is not necessarily valid. Well, I want to jump in and go back because, you know, what you were talking about, the that study with heart disease and eating meat, there's a picture and I just posted it in the Starch Queen's Facebook page. I got it from Esther Health and it's a picture of two vials of syringes. And what they did is they had plasma that they'd spun down from two different patients in preparation for platelet rich plasma injections. And the plasma on the right side is from a vegan and on the left is from an omnivore who ate a meat sandwich. And it, you can't see through the tube. In the vegan one, you can see clear to the back and you can see the numbers and data from the person who had eaten a meat sandwich, a cheese meat sandwich. You can't see through it, it's cloudy. And I'm like, oh my God, you are literally seeing the fat and cholesterol. Have, did you see that picture, Nancy? Oh yeah, it's amazing. Oh my gosh. I mean, and that is what's clogging up inside. And that's what's happening as we, we're coming into the holidays. I mean, because, you know, every, it's, it seems like we want these wonderful, magical days of, of the holidays and getting together. And we have these Norman Rockwell Christmas things. And it just it becomes so, so hard to avoid these very high, high caloric density foods, the high fat, high salt, high sugar. We did have a question, Nancy. Did you see it? It's gone by in the feed already. I yeah. don't see it anymore. So, yes, Mary, Mary Ann Smith is asking, one thing I have thought about, can you cleanse the kidneys like you can cleanse the li liver? Is that a stupid question? Because she's, Mary Ann was a dialysis tech. So she was curious about uh, kidney cleanses. Okay, so l let me uh, say two things. One is, that a vial that's cloudy versus a vial that's not cloudy with a vegan that's not cloudy and one that has cheese and what was it? The ham and cheese. Ham and cheese. Ham and cheese. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it's really interesting and I think it's suggestive. It doesn't necessarily say it's going to clog your arteries, but it's suggestive that it is. It, so absolutely. I, want to, I want to clarify that it may not be, but I want to make sure right. that we all understand that it's suggestive, not and the other thing is, you want to make sure you're not a dirty vegan. And a dirty vegan, I mean, and when I say dirty vegan, I don't want to have the mindset of dirty being something else, but dirty vegan, not eating dirt or something like that, but dirty vegan being somebody who eats processed foods and everything else that's almost like a meat eating person. And now the meat eating that we pick was probably the most saturated fat you could possibly choose. So to be fair, you know, this is one extreme and then hopefully they picked a clean vegan or a healthy vegan. We won't call them a clean vegan because clean vegan sounds like they scrubbed the floors and they eat it off the floor. But we're talking about healthy vegan here. Right. So a healthy vegan probably has a clear vial, but we don't even know the comparison, what the two vials we're looking at. I know, but the picture was just powerful. Right. No, no, really it, is, it is, it is very telling and it is, it is very powerful that you see this effect. So I just wanted to clarify that it's nice to see it, but what's more telling is when you see a study that's done by Esselstein, right? And you see the reversal of the left anterior descending artery, the widow maker artery yes. in heart disease. And you actually see the reversal where the artery goes from narrowing to opening up as if it's a normal artery. That's called reversal. And that is unbelievable. And that is hard to argue against because that's not just taking the vial, but the vial is suggestive of what that looks like. Right. And really, the short term is also suggestive that it can lead to the long term. But right. even having said just the short term, you see narrowing in the blood vessels. And right. narrowing in the blood vessels in the short term is amazing because it's an implication of what happens in the long term. And this narrowing is really kind of dangerous and can lead to potentially yeah. heart attacks, can potentially right. lead to heart attacks. 
We don't know the statistics on it, but it can lead to heart attacks. Now, to go back to the question, sorry about that. That's um, okay. No, that's go, it's very important to know that. To go back to the kidney aspect, uh, is there such a thing as a kidney cleanse? Now, dialysis in medicine is supposed to be a cleanse. Think about what dialysis is exactly. supposed to be. It's exactly. supposed to be a cleanse. Does it really cleanse? Mm, it removes toxins and it removes urea and things like that that we really need to remove. But does it really get the functioning of the kidney to go up and stay up? No, it doesn't necessarily do that. And so it's <coughs> a good question. And in terms of cleanse, I don't know what you mean by cleanse. I know that you can reverse the functioning of the kidneys and the kidney can turn around and um, the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate can go up. And so the kidney function can get much better. But when I think of a cleanse, which I'm not even sure exists, because a cleanse to me means I put in an enema in somebody's GI tract and all of a sudden I've cleansed their bowels. That's not really a cleanse. It's, it's like a short-term cleanse, but you can't really have an impact on the kidneys that's that short term and expect it to then say, okay, I can eat whatever I want, I can do whatever I want, and now the kidneys will bounce back. So, well, didn't the guy the, right. who, did the, who did the rice diet? Um, <clears throat> Pritikin. Pritikin. No, 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 it wasn't Pritikin. It was at Duke University. But he had a lot of, of, of serious people coming in with chronic kidney diseases. And he mm -hmm. put them on the, you know, what he called the rice diet. And but that's not a cleanse. No, no. But I mean, he saw, he saw the kidney coming back to life and right. seeing, seeing it heal itself. Right. Right. Well, that's, that's just because it was giving, you know, some nutrition, some carbohydrate and removing all of the inflammation from the meat and dairy. Oh, absolutely. Right. Well, right. So what I'm, what I'm saying and what, 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 you got, what you guys are picking up on is <laughs> I don't think there is such a thing. A cleanse makes you healthier. So in other words, a kidney cleanse, a liver cleanse, a detox, all of that is interesting terminology and sounds really interesting and would be great if it actually existed where it created tremendous functioning all of a sudden in the kidneys on long term but, or on the liver. But I don't really think that there is a cleanse that does that. And the only cleanse that I know of in medicine that we use that people really love did you ever have a colonoscopy? Sadly. Have you ever had a colonoscopy? Yes. Jean, have you had a yes. colonoscopy? Yes. And what's the worst part about a colonoscopy? The preparation. Oh right. my and God. The You're having your brain the pre out. The preparation is quote unquote a cleanse. Yeah. It's yeah. a go lightly that is, Ugh. ironically, it's not go lightly. It removes a lot of fecal material and it causes you to feel awful. And it's nasty. not helping you by removing yeah. that fecal material. If you're eating well, it's actually hurting your gut. Yeah. So it really you, messes up your gut biome right. when you but do so, that. Right. So what I'm trying to say is cleanses are not necessarily a good thing. Mm. And the terminology cleanse is not necessarily a, associated in a positive way. So I have a couple of things. Um, Walter Kemper. Kempner. Walter Kempner. Oh, you beat oh, right. Kempner. Right, 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 right. Walter right. Kempner. That's right. uh, Debbie Osborne Lewis of our uh, Sarge Queens group. She uh, shared that with us. Okay. Marianne again, she's asking, can a person that was on dialysis come back from dialysis? Now, what she didn't ask, Marianne, is I'm going to interject into your question is, and I'm going to turn it into a new question, is can a person with advanced chronic kidney disease who's on dialysis change to a whole food plant-based lifestyle and will the kidneys reverse disease and heal? Well, that's a big question and it's a big, you know, I, I don't know. It's a good question and it's not an easy question to find because right. the people you have who are on dialysis tend not to follow what you say and they end up on dialysis. So oh. it's, it's a catch 22, but it's a great question. So, Theoretically, could you do it? Yes, you could. Awesome. You could reverse it. Now, if they're not urinating, 
it may be that much more difficult because there are people who are on dialysis who are still urinating, who are still excreting. And if there's no urination, it may be much more difficult. Now, but people who are urinating and getting dialysis but not urinating enough, obviously, where they're removing enough toxins, they may be able to benefit tremendously. But here's the bottom line. There's no downside to trying. Oh, right. Because the downside to trying is that you get healthier. And so I've seen people right now, I've seen patients, the patients I've had have been anywhere from GFR of seven to eight and up. But have they been on dialysis? So far, I have one patient who's on dialysis. And this patient who's on dialysis wow. is a patient who was about a 14, went up, his GF, this is GFR, and dialysis happens after less than 15. So I want you to understand what it is. So stage five kidney disease, or what's called end-stage renal disease, ESRD, occurs below GFR of 15. And this guy was, I inherited him around 15 or so. He did what I asked him to do for a couple months, and his kidney function went up by about 45%. That's huge. Right. Then he decided he liked Chinese buffets. Mm. And he started eating the Chinese buffets. Mm. So his kidney function went down by about 20% when he did that. And then he Why? ended up... Why? What's, what's wrong with the Chinese buffet? Let's go into that. What's wrong with the Chinese buffet? That is a right. great, great question. So Chinese food, you know, this is a really good topic. And I don't mean to just go into this, but... Chinese food is like vegan food. And when I say that, I mean there's dirty Chinese and there's healthy Chinese. And just like there's dirty vegans and there's healthy vegans. So if you eat the way people in China originally eat it, like the farmers, the agriculture, the areas where they were um, growing all the food, you tend to get incredible results. And you tend to get uh, T. Colin Campbell's China study results. But then you start eating the westernized Chinese food and you get all this negative effect. So the westernized Chinese food now falls into the dirty Chinese food or the standard American diet. And so what happens with it, what happens with it is that there's too much salt. There is so much salt in Chinese food typically. But when you add in all these sauces and stuff like that, it jacks up the salt, which creates the GFR or causes the GFR glomular filtration rate or the kidney function to go down. And that has a really negative impact dehydrating the patient and negatively impacting the kidneys. And the kidneys are, as they get dehydrated, are working harder and harder, but have less function. So the GFR goes down. Wow. So then what else is wrong with Chinese food? Let me give you, sorry. We, I'm, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Were you saying something, Nancy? No, I just said that's amazing. Oh, just, okay. wow. And then there's another piece. Another piece is it has too much sugar and too much fat. So let me give you an example. I have a patient, and I, I've mentioned this once before, but let me give you this example. I have a patient who has diabetes. She did everything I said to do. She went six weeks and she lost 18 pounds, of, 18 pounds of weight and 12 pounds of fat. And you say, wow, that's great. So what happened to her A1C, her three-month sugar? So her three-month sugar was nine. And so you would expect it to come tumbling down because the study Hi. suggests that when you lose that much weight, you're going to drop the sugars. What happened? The sugar actually went from nine to 9.6. And what was she doing? And what was she doing? Yeah. Thank you, Jean. She was eating Chinese food. I said, eat steamed vegetables with the sauce on the side from the Chinese restaurant. What was she doing? She said, well, I didn't tell them to put on the sauce on the side. I just wanted to have the sauce. So I was just having them put, they cooked it with the sauce and then the sugars went up. And that was the only thing causing the sugars to go up. 
because everything else she was doing correctly. So what I'm saying is that Chinese food from a buffet is, tends to be, unless it's specified not to be, but tends to be, and especially in an American buffet, American Chinese buffet, Chinese American buffet, um, American <laughs> Chinese buffet. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Right, right. Tends to be the standard American diet just yeah. in sheep's clothing. Right. right. You know, and, and that's what it is. So it's no different from McDonald's. Yeah, right. that's, that's amazing. And this is the other thing. This is the other thing. When we talk about a high fat meal or high salt meal or whatever, and I want to talk about a study that I have on high salt, which is really incredible. Um, when we talk about a high fat meal, you got to think about supersize me. Oh my God. The wow, movie, the movie. guy did, right. The yeah. guy started out by eating McDonald's and every time they said supersize, he said, yes, he had to say yes. And within less than a month, thank you for the jingle. Thank you for the jingle. It's already, um, but within, within less than a month, his cholesterol was through the roof yeah. and his inflammation was through the roof. And his doctor said, you have to get off this because you're going to have a heart attack. And that was in less than a month, but that was meal after meal after meal. Wow. Yeah. But that is the epitome of what happens with a high fat meal. One meal after another. Does one meal have an impact? Oh yeah. Does two meals. So let's go back to the one meal. What does like you have, Oh my God. I mean, let me, let me, let me, let me go back to it. Let me go back to it. I'm going to steal your thunder because I am. Cause you can, I can. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so in terms of salts effects on a high salt meal. Okay. And high salt meals occur anytime, but especially during festival. And you know, when people put lots of different uh, spices in it, but they want to use salt to give it a lot of flavor. And people say, oh, there's nothing wrong with salt. I don't have high blood pressure. And what does one high salt meal do? When you say one high salt meal, they're talking about, with this study, 3.8 grams, which is 3,800 milligrams. And you think to yourself, well, I would never eat 3,800 milligrams in one meal. It's very easy to do that. It is. It's very easy to do that. Take into account the processed foods, the breads, the sauces, all of these things have a lot of salt. So if you use soy sauce, for instance, let's talk Chinese here. Oh, wow. If you use soy sauce, full-blown soy sauce, a teaspoon of full-blown soy sauce is 1,100 milligrams of sodium, a right teaspoon. And One so, teaspoon. It's yeah. crazy. So when you're talking about a teaspoon, you're using a lot of salt. And a lot of salt is used in Asian foods, and a lot of salt is used in the holidays. And you're using a lot of salt regularly. And so what happens when you have one high salt meal? Well, you get a non-blood pressure related effect. And the title of the study was called Endothelial Function is Impaired After a High Salt Meal in Healthy Subjects. Endothelial function, the endothelium is a lining, the inner lining of the blood vessel. And what's really important about the inner lining of the blood vessel is it's what tells the muscles in the blood vessel to expand so that now you're vasodilating it causing the blood vessel to vasodilate or enlarge and so the endothelial layer is very important to tell the rest of the blood vessel what to do and so it usually takes if you take vegetables and you eat vegetables vegetables have nitrates and you say to yourself well nitrates are bad but nitrates in vegetables are not bad they turn into nitric oxide through the endothelium. And the endothelium nitric oxide then causes the blood vessel to expand through the muscles in the middle layer. So this is a wonderful process and this is what you want to happen. However, when you have too much salt, and I'm getting back to this, so don't think I just went off on a tangent. Okay. A high salt meal, you get negative impacts in 30 minutes on the functioning of the blood vessel. And this was published in- Not the even 30 minutes, I'm sorry. That study may say that, but oh my God, I can feel it if I have a high salt meal in minutes. Yeah, but you don't know how long it took to consume that. So maybe it isn't minutes, maybe it's been that meal and it already is 30 minutes. 
So don't just jump into thinking that was, yeah, exactly. When did you start with that? <laughs> Uncle Sam wants to know. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so what happens is you get significantly what's called significantly, I can't speak, significantly reduced flow mediated dilation, the ability of the blood vessel to dilate, like we mentioned. And so um, that happens at 30 minutes and an hour after the meal. It's the impact is similar to when you have a high fat meal, especially saturated fat. But when you have a high fat meal, you get the same narrowing. You get the same reduction in flow mediated dilation. And so what's interesting is that salt almost plays the same role as a high fat meal does in wow. one meal. And you don't think about that. Mm-hmm. Salt has that same impact. We think of salt as, well, I don't have high blood pressure, so I don't have to worry. And, you know, the scary part about it is that several studies have shown this. So what I just described is one study, but then another study also showed it. But so the, fat, the salt and fat are together. They're like good buds. You know, they hang yeah, out yeah, together. Yeah, but, they're, but they're not always. Not always. Remember, I told you that this woman lost 12 pounds of fat, but yet her sugars went up. So the right. sugar doesn't necessarily hang out with the fat. So the salt can hang out separately. So yes, we don't necessarily just eat salt, but the salt can hang out separately from the fat. So don't necessarily yeah, think- Yeah, but usually they're, they're good company, you know. No, they- no, yeah, they're good company if you're doing the standard American diet, but not necessarily. You can still uh-huh. have a high salt diet by using miso soup. That's not high fat. Right. How is miso soup high uh, fat? It's right, but very high salt, yes. Right, it's very, very high salt. Okay, you so, scored a point. You and scored here, one point. Here's the other thing. The thing we don't take into account when we think about salt is that people in the integrative community, some people profess that it doesn't matter how much salt you have because salt isn't dangerous unless you have high blood pressure necessarily. And that's not correct. Salt is dangerous when it's high, whether it's from high blood pressure, whether it's increased risk of heart disease. As we know, salt increases the risk of heart failure potentially or increases the risk of heart disease. But now we know that it causes narrowing just like high fat. So what you have to think about and what we learned from this topic, most importantly, is that high salt is just like high fat when it comes to the impact it has on the heart and blood vessels. Well, when you go out to eat, like my husband and I went out to this restaurant, I'm not going to say what, but we were standing in line and it's a kind of, you know, it has a Mexican type of food and you, you know, make, you go down the line and you pick what you want and all these things. And I sat there because the line was long and I was bored, you know, and I went online and they had an app and you could go through and say, if I pick this, 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 and it added up all the nutritional ingredients. And I, and I turned to my husband and I said, if I eat here, this is going to kill me. And I, I know, I mean, we had to leave because before we even ordered, because I was like, oh, oh my gosh, how much salt was in that? I mean, it was something, it was, it was I want to say like 3,800 gra- milligrams of salt. Right, right, right. In one meal. Right. It was like, oh my God, I could, that would have killed me. It would have. Yeah. I mean. Right. And people eat this every day, multiple times a day. I That's know. the sad thing is that they're eating it more than once a day. If they'll go to like Dr. Um, David was saying about like McDonald's and then they go to the restaurant you were talking about and then they throw in just uh, the ham and cheese sandwich that was talked about earlier. They're getting thousands of milligrams of sodium per day. And then the fat on top of that coupled with the sugar, it's everything that we're talking about tonight. So Dr. Danae, if we have a comment here, Real, I want to go back real quick. Marianne is saying that people on dialysis have to eat meat. That is what their doctor recommends because it has less fluids. Now, is there any merit to that? Yeah, if you're paid by the meat industry, yes. That's kind of what I figured. And okay. so the answer to that question, and not to be snide and to be tongue-in-cheek here, 
But no, in fact, the funny thing about it is, and I don't mean to pick on anybody and I don't mean to pull any names or anything like that, but, and this is not everybody, but, you know, ironically, nephrologists, kidney doctors, are the people who put patients on diuretics, water pills that actually dry out the kidneys. And that's amazing to me because that has a higher risk. And they're the ones who say it has the least impact of negative impacts, side effects. But actually, it affects the kidneys the worst because it dries out the kidneys. And they're also the ones that when you're talking about protein, they worry that the patient's not getting enough protein. And the ironic thing is that what do you think di diuretics do? They dry out the kidneys, which then lowers the glomerular filtration rate. If you then throw on more animal protein, that puts more stress on the kidneys, which lowers the glomerular filtration rate even no, more. No, really? Yes, yes, wow. and not only that, but then you start dumping protein in your urine. That's and when bad. you start dumping protein in your urine, you cause all these problems. And then what they worry about when you look at a dialysis patient also is the phosphorus, the phosphate level. And they measure that and it goes up and it goes up because animal protein has a lot of phosphate. Are, isn't there, are they seeing like cause effect? I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand. And I'm not saying all nephrologists, not at all, but I've noticed that some nephrologists, but I'm just saying, you know, as a doctor, wouldn't you want to have more in depth information and, and notice about the cause and effect? I mean, some nephrologists are brilliant, and many nephrologists are brilliant, by the way. They are absolutely brilliant. They are one of the smartest people, group of people I know because they deal wow. with all the technical mumbo jumbo. And some will agree with me, and they're absolutely floored by it. But there's a certain portion that will put people on diuretics and will worry about protein. When in reality, low protein is not great either. I mean, to have a low protein, we don't know if that's beneficial because the studies suggest that low, low protein is not beneficial. But too much protein we know is not beneficial right. for the kidneys. And right. it's, but when we're talking protein, we're talking mainly animal protein because animal protein has the phosphorus or the phosphate. Right. And that's what hurts the kidneys. The other thing that hurts the kidneys is the TMA that we have discussed before. And TMA then got oxidized to TMAO, which then causes atherosclerosis of the arteries in mm. the kidneys. And most wow. heart disease patients, six out of 10, don't die of heart attack. They die of kidney failure. Mm. So sad. I mean, I, I call animal protein inside the human body a dirty bomb. Yeah. You know, they're just a, a Trojan horse, a dirty bomb. They're just terrible. Uh, Jean, do you want to um, ask Dr. David um, Jules' yes. question? That's a good one. That is. She says, Jules is commented and said, a client went on an SIS free. Well, I think that's a typo. I think that's a typo. SOS salt free, oil. salt, oil, sugar free. We're assuming. Hopefully, that's Jules, you'll comment on that salt oil sugar-free food plan and said the sugar level went up after each starch meal. She added back in oil and the sugar level went down. So she's why? questioning why. Well, having not seen what she's eating, which right. makes it more difficult. I mean, it's kind of like saying when patients say to me, my ankle hurts. And they say, why? I say, well, first of all, which ankle? And then they tell me, and then I get more detail. So I need more detail to be able to answer this in a comprehensive manner. Right. However, right. having said that, however, that's a cop out a little bit. It depends on if the oil was replacing some of the sugar. So if the oil is replacing some of the starchy vegetables, uh -huh. or if the oil is, if there's a changeover, if there's a change in diet, where you're replacing one thing with another thing and you're taking out some of the sugars, that may be why the sugars went down. And it may not be the oil, it may be what you're cooking with the oil. In other words, if you're, instead of having 
the potato, you're having cauliflower rice that you're cooking with oil. Now the sugars go down, but that's not because of the oil. That's because you're no longer having that starchy vegetable. Okay, so we need to know more, a little bit more about exactly right. what you was eating. Oil isn't protective, right. lowering sugar. We, we as human beings can make associations by the prefrontal cortex, and it's a wonderful thing that we can do, but we don't necessarily use it correctly. We make associations that are so wildly off sometimes. And right. Yeah. So, for instance, I had a patient who said, okay, I've been drinking the smoothie you gave me, and I'm having diarrhea. So it must be due to the smoothie. Now, this patient had been on the drinking the smoothie for three to six months. And I said, really? And you've had diarrhea for the last three days? And she said, yes. And she said, it must be due to that. And I said, okay, I could see maybe it is, but let's ask another question. What else have you been eating? What did you add? And she said, well, nothing. Okay, maybe I had three days of heavy amount of cream tearing. And I said, oh, and you think it's related to the, the smoothie. smoothie for three yeah. to six months versus yeah. the three days of extreme heavy cream. You see what I'm saying? Yes. We make associations and we don't know what it is that changes and we right. have to look at it much more carefully. So one of the things, Dr. Denise, if I just asked uh, Jewel, um, <laughs> I just put a comment in here is mm -hmm. I asked her is if she was eating whole grain uh, breads because I, Gene and I found through our program that there's a lot of people that are borderline diabetic that when they eat the refined grains and the pastas, their, their A1C comes down slower, their blood sugar comes down slower. So like you were saying, there's, there's a lot of blame on the starches, but when you get underneath what really is eaten, say in a day, two days in a week, we find that there's more and more consumption of refined grains. I, I definitely think refined grains has a negative impact. In fact, there was a study done that was recently published by David Jenkins at Harvard that looked at low carb diet and there was a big deal just made of it. And what they found was they used animal protein, like uh, chicken or something like that. And then they either had white potato or white rice with it. Okay. And, or they replaced it with cauliflower rice. And what they found was that this was basically a, a weight loss or weight maintenance aspect. And what it was trying to argue was, the hypothesis was that not all calories are created equal. So it was right. an isocaloric comparison. And what they found was that and they had brought these two groups their weight down so they weren't trying to lose weight at all it wasn't about weight loss but what they found was that people who ate a replacement of cauliflower rice instead of white potato and white rice had burned about 250 calories per day more than the people who ate the white rice and white potato Right. And so it really is, what are you replacing it with? And when you're replacing grains or refined grains, you get tremendous effect. And the same thing was shown when you took bean pasta, uh, not bean pasta, but uh, lentil flour. And lentil flour is like lentil pasta that you can get. And you can also get it in lentil spaghetti either way. What they did was they replaced half of the refined grains with this lentil flour, and they found that the sugars went down much quicker. It's the same idea as when you replace out refined grains. However, right. what would be an interesting study is to compare, and I know that you guys think of starches, but an interesting study is to compare whole grain versus refined grain. And right. see if you see a difference there and what the impact is not using non-starchy vegetables because non-starchy vegetables are not grains at all. Right. So what you really want to look at is, is it grains? And you want to compare, if you really want to do a good study, what you really want to do 
is you want to look at white potato. It doesn't matter whether it's white potato or sweet potato. If you want to use white potato or sweet potato, they basically have the same impact. And you want to use white rice, then what you'd use is, say, oatmeal and quinoa and millet and compare those two and then have another arm where you used lentil flour and compare that and then you have another arm where you don't use lentil flour, you use cauliflower rice. And you see, is there a degradation just like the Aventus 2 trial did, the Aventus Health Study 2, where it took people who ate mostly plants and were vegan, then they took people and they added in fish, pescatarian, and then they added in lacto-ovo, and then they added in meat-eating, or they added in semi-vegetarian, then meat-eating. So they had delineations of five different classes. We need a study with refined grains. Are you going to be doing that? All the way up. Exactly. Am I, am I going to be doing that? Well, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, I've seen results in my practice in terms of on an individual basis on results like that. That's why I break it down like that. And okay, I we've say, got a question. And I say, I just, just to finish off, I say that the study that was done by David Jenkins, I gave him a lot of credit for doing that because it answers, Nancy, what you're asking, which is, are refined grains a negative impact? And the answer is yes. And yeah. especially with people, what they found was, especially with people who had higher insulin levels. Yep. That's what our, you know, what we found in our group and um, with who we're coaching, that they really do have a negative impact. And like they say, not all starches are created equal. So, you know, you just got to, you got to watch if you're especially somebody who's sensitive <laughs> to... Uh, not all people respond the same way. Exactly. And I like Everybody's to say that, different. right, I say that no body is the same. We say that too. We're on the same page. Jean, we have a Sherry Miller question. Do you want to ask that it? Was, oh my God, that was what I was going to be going on. We're on the same it's, wavelength. It's our starch-based brains. It is. We're on the same wavelength. <laughs> okay. She says, I know, Sherry Miller says, I know I'm going to be eating things that contain sugar. They're part of my family tradition. Cookies, breads, chocolate. It literally lights up my brain and I find myself eating it again and again. And each time I want more. Sherry, you and I have the same question because wow, same thing happens. Why does sugar have such a hold on me? Well, for multiple reasons. Sugar is a drug. It has an addiction just like a drug. And what happens is you have dopamine that goes up. And when dopamine goes up, that's the pleasure center in the brain. And it touches that pleasure center. So you say to yourself, wow, I've got to have more. It's like a heroin addict chasing a high. Oh, yeah. so the first time you have that sugar, it has a tremendous impact that you go, whoa, this is good. And your body goes, you ever see a child who's never had an ice cream or something or never had sugar and you give them, someone gives them a sugar and they go, whoa, I'll use an example. Did you see the movie Wonder Woman? No, nope, missed that one. Oh my God, Nancy. It was so good. Exactly, thank you. So good. It's, so it's, and, and, it, and it's such a woman's movie. Oh, it is like, the, I want to be an Amazon. Right, because the women are the heroines. They're, they're amazing. The heroes, and they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And when Gaul, she eats and ice cream for the first time, she tastes it. Yeah, she because goes, she has to go mortal. She goes, right, she goes, oh my God, this is so good, this is so good. When Wonder Woman tastes that ice cream, she's like, this is, this is unbelievable. That's the effect we get. And then we chase that high by eating more and more sugar. It's true, and we chasing want the that, dragon. Right, we want that high. And then what happens is, there's another part to it besides the addiction, which is the insulin levels go up. After you have a lot of sugar, you get a sugar spike. Then the insulin kicks in. When the insulin kicks in, you get a sugar low. So you get hypoglycemic almost aspect. And you don't like that feeling. It's kind of like when a heroin addict gets a high and then they're weaned off the heroin and then they feel completely completely lousy with no energy, lightheaded, a little nauseous, tired. Does this 
ring a bell to you after you eat a meal with high amounts of sugar and fat, you know, after you're done, but especially with the sugar, after you're done, you kind of feel tired and you feel oh, like wait. you're dizzy. And I, I got to share this one with you. When I was teaching overseas, the, the classroom, I don't know why they put this, the first grade classroom across from a high school science classroom. I don't know why, but they did whatever. And every day I would see the same thing because these kids would go for lunch. These six-year-olds would go for lunch and have on an average two cups of Pepsi or Coke, all right, sugary drink, and then would have Twinkies. You know, instead of getting the lunch that was there, they just bought the Twinkies, the yum-yums, the ho-hos, the ding-dongs, whatever those are, and they ate 100% pure sugar for lunch. And literally, I felt so bad <laughs> for the teacher. She brought them back into the classroom and there was no way she could get any kind of work out of them at all in any way, shape or form. And I'd see the kids, they were literally bouncing off the walls, literally. And then I would come back and about one period later, after that class was done, I'd look across the hall, the kids would be passed out on their desk, literally. Almost every day this happened. It was in incredible. To go back to Nancy's statement, it's an addiction and it's the prefrontal cortex that's affected, it's the dopamine that's affected, it's the insulin levels, it's the feeling lousy. All of that together makes you want more. Oh, it's so true, it's and so, so true. When you want more. It's an addiction. Yeah, it's an it's addiction. addiction. It's a total it's addiction. addiction. You become physiologically dependent on it. It is terrible, and there's people like me, I've never been the sugar addict. I was the salty fat person. I wanted the, the Lay's potato chips. I could take it or leave sugar. Sugar's never have been an issue for me. I it's just a non issue. But now salt and sugar not salt and, salt salt and fat. fat is a whole nother story. I could eat that crunchy potato chip all day long. That's where my my dopamine's that's what my dopamine seeks. So I have to stay away from those. It's uh it's truly a bummer. Well, when I do, I mean, like if I have, you know, when, when my family gets together, one of the things they do is Cape Cod potato chips and Frito-Lay's corn chips, and they kill me, absolutely kill me. And I can't <laughs> stop. Recently, or anything that I've consumed that has a tremendous amount of salt in it, it literally takes me at least two days to flush that out at a minimum. Right, right, right. And it's not uncommon. You know, salt on a short-term basis, and I can tell you, from personal experience, and I can tell you from patient experience and from anecdotal stories from my patients, that salt can cause dehydration. And dehydration causes potentially things like arrhythmias, like it can exacerbate atrial fibrillation potentially. It can also cause swelling in the fingers, ankles, and it can cause you to be dizzy and it can cause you to have to wake up in the middle of the night and pee more or urinate more because you're drinking more water to make up for it and then you end up having to urinate in the middle of the night and that's a sign that you've had a salty meal. So the more times you wake up in the middle of the night to have to pee. Now, of course, if you went out and you drank two gallons of water before you went to bed, that's not a sign of a salty meal or you ate a piece of fruit right before you went to bed that's not a sign of a salty meal however barring those type of things if you have to pee more if you have to get up in the night and there are studies that show this it suggests that you've had too much salt the night before and i've experienced that myself i've had an asian meal where i've told them to put everything on the side and it was still the sauce drizzled on was still too salty for me even with the teaspoon drizzled on it depended on what it was. It was just too thick. And it created this idea that I had to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the night, two or three times. And as soon as I stopped eating that specific item, it went away. And so a lot of times when we have, for instance, soup that we eat out, it has so much sodium. It oh. can have that 3.8 grams of salt. And we yeah. say to ourselves, but it's a vegetable soup. Yeah. Matter. No, I, I did. I, I had that issue. And I went to one restaurant and I checked. I made sure it was vegan. I made sure there was no oil added. I made sure and it was a black bean soup. And they had, and that, I had one cup, one cup, one cup, eight ounces. 
in that one cup, it was like something like 56% of your daily nutritional requirement for salt. And, it, and it's crazy because you feel lousy afterwards. Oh, no. I get blood pressure headaches. I actually do. I'm yeah, one of the rare yeah. people that, do, that get them. People get reactions to it, but they react to it different ways. They react to it with edema, the swelling. They react to it with arrhythmias. They react to it with lightheadedness. They yeah. react to it with the headaches. They yeah. react to it many, many different ways. They react to it with wanting to drink so much water because they know that they're, they can feel parched and no matter how much they drink, they never get enough because right. you can't just make up for it by drinking lots of water. So how can you also fend off too much salt in the holiday? In general, if you have too much salt, what's the best thing to do? Drink more Very water. Food. Drink it more water, right? Wait, Cheers. Wait. What, what's the answer? Drink more water, right? yeah no but that's no you prepare your own food no no if you have too much salt if you already had too much salt how do you counteract too much i know salt? how do you flush it out of the system you don't you eat foods with a lot of potassium because that counteracts the sodium the yin and the yang right right i mean once you've done it at least when you're doing it and you have a high salty meal have of meals with a lot of potassium in them. And that could be from dark leafy greens, which have a ton of potassium. That could be from almonds, which have a ton of potassium. That could be from oranges, which oranges which have a, a ton of potassium. Bananas have some potassium, but they don't have as much potassium as people think. Raisins have a lot of potassium. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these foods have a lot of potassium. So when you, for instance, when you burn your mouth with spicy sauce, right? You drink lots of water to get rid of it. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. But if yeah. you eat something and you eat something that absorbs it, it goes away almost immediately. You yeah. eat a little rice. You eat something that absorbs it, like brown rice or whatever, white rice, doesn't matter what the rice is. But if you just eat a little bit of it, it absorbs it right away and it goes off the taste buds. Yeah. it's uh... You need the same thing. You need the same thing when it comes to too much salt. You need not the water, but the foods with potassium in them. That's good to know. That's very, it's a very good point. So Jean, we're coming up on the, the hour. We're, we're, we're up on the up. hour. It's yeah. our, I mean, our, 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 our hour with Dr. David Deneff just goes way too quickly. I know. I There's know. so You're much to share. I mean, I mean, we could just do this every day for hours and, and Dr. Deneff, like Marianne was saying, I don't know if you're seeing the comments, but Marianne said she's sharing this to her Facebook page because she's, she's very concerned about her children. So, I mean, this is information that we've got to get out to the masses. This is information that people don't realize. And it's like mind boggling when people don't put two and two together with the sodium content and how the body reacts to that like fat and, and the amount of sodium in the standard American diet when you eat out at restaurants. Restaurant eating killed my dad. That's the bottom line. He ate out, he was a truck driver before he was a farmer and he ate out at least two meals a day and he had severe advanced chronic heart disease, two open heart surgeries, five bypasses the first time, um, I think five, well, a total of 10 or 11 and then congestive heart failure. And so it was restaurant food. It's just so laden with fat and sugar. And well, salt. yeah, Joel Furman talks about it. Fast food genocide. Exactly. Amazing, Amazing book. Amazing book. Amazing. Amazing book. Everybody needs well, to we should, we should do a segment on chronic kidney disease. And chronic yes. kidney disease should really be for next time. And we should yes. go off on that because there's so much to talk about. And one of the things I'll leave you with, because you always like a little bit of a study, is that the data from 2002 to 2016, there's been a 56% increase in chronic kidney disease. Wow. Whereas well, most chronic... Yeah. Diseases have gone down slightly, wow. slightly. We're not talking about much, potentially. Yeah. Uh, diabetes not going down, it's going up. And then it's going down, then it's going up, then it's going down, then it's going up. And obesity not going down, it's going up. But, you know, but, there's, but in general, the one that's been quietly going up very fast is chronic kidney disease. And it's the silent killer. And um, we don't talk enough about it. So I think that a really good follow-up with this would be chronic kidney disease. Okay, so and send us your questions. I would really like Please. that. Yeah, I'd like that. My friend Mary Beth, who's uh, just tuned in and is watching, her sister just donated a kidney to her husband 
who has a genetic kidney condition. And so I would like to incorporate Dr. Deneyev, not just the standard American diet and how it's, you know, a causation for kidney no, disease, no, no, no. but I also genetic it. kidney disease and right. how a whole food plant-based lifestyle can influence the genes. Uh, improvement with right. that, uh, right. with that uh, genetic. Right. You want, you want to, you want to know something ironic too? The nephrologist who said uh, this guy's kidney was doing really, really well. The guy had low sodium, but the nephrologist didn't say anything about the low sodium. And I thought he would, but the low sodium was where he naturally sits below the level, which can be dangerous if it's too low causing dizziness, but ultimately causing coma. So you don't want no sodium in your diet. Right. And that's not what we're talking about with the whole foods plant-based because dark leafy greens have a ton of sodium in them already. Right. So it's not as if you're getting no sodium. If you eat a lot of greens, you get about 800 milligrams right there without putting anything on it. And that includes, say, you never use anything that has sodium in it. And that's really hard not to do. So right. having said that. Right. But the potassium was... On the high normal level, it was about 5.4. Normal was up to 5.3. And he was saying, well, I may have to give you a drug to reduce the potassium level. And I keep explaining to the patient that the potassium level going up based on food has no negative impact. And it's very interesting about that. And we should talk more about that and what that means. And there's a drug called kx that you give to get the potassium down. But you don't need to do that when you're on, it, it's coming from food. And that's a whole discussion. And I'm just trying to whet the appetite, no pun all intended, right. because the kidney's all about <laughs> wetting. And so we really want to go into chronic kidney disease. And all right. It really is the silent killer. But we need to get into this topic, absolutely. Please share this topic tonight. Please share it on your timeline. Please share it in other groups. People need to hear this information. And so you could help us by sharing this information, number one. Yeah. But please send us your questions, tag Nancy or I, and then we'll get them on our show for with Dr. Deneev. And we'll be talking about these questions uh, next time when we'll set a date with you. Thank you, Dr. Deneev, for joining us. And this was a great topic. I mean, we could talk for hours about salt, sugar, and fat, and then how that uh, incorporates into chronic di kidney disease. It's just amazing. Love the human body. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dedea. Thank you, everybody. It's my pleasure. Have thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.